Well, welcome to 10 Minute Record Reviews, episode 342. This is the fourth of my series of label guides. It's a bit daunting because it's Blue Note, the daddy of them all. What I hope to do in this video is to demystify this famous label a little bit and hopefully allow newer collectors to become smarter shoppers for Blue Note vinyl. Uh, there's probably not much in here for very, very experienced Blue Note collectors other than the opportunity to point out in the comments where I've screwed up and I encourage you to do that in the spirit in which I'm extending this offer. So thank you in advance. Now, the first thing to say is that this video is hardly the only source of information out there on Blue Note. There is a lot of information about Blue Note. There is the great book by Richard Havers, Uncompromising Expressions. There is Fred Cohen's Guide to Blue Note First Pressings. There is a wonderful book, or at least one book, maybe more, on uh, Reed Miles's covers and on Frank Wolf's photography. Um, there are documentaries. There's a recent one called Beyond the Notes, which is not bad, although it suffers a little bit from focusing on a present day concert to uh, the exclusion of a lot richer detail on the label historically. Uh, there are also documentaries on Blue Note on YouTube, on Rudy Van Gelder on YouTube. You can find a whole bunch of information and that's before we even get to the internet. And there are lots and lots of great pages dedicated to Blue Note. There are uh, whole threads within Steve Hoffman's music forums, which are very instructive, a lot of them. There are some great historical sites dealing with Blue Note. There is, of course, a lot of great information on the Blue Note website itself. My personal favorite is a website maintained by a guy who goes by the moniker of the London Jazz Collector, who is not just about Blue Note, but Blue Note is basically the pinnacle of his mountain. He's very much into hard bop, 55 to 65. And he has, A, done an enormous amount of work to compile and systematically present information which is of use both to the beginning collector, but also to people who are more experienced collectors. And on top of that, over time in his following, he's accumulated a whole bunch of people who really are very knowledgeable as well about Blue Notes. And so there is any amount of information you can glean from the LJC site. I owe that site a lot of debt in terms of the material I'm about to present to you here. And I recommend that you scurry over there as soon as you can after this video is over to check it out. London Jazz Collector, really, really amazing resource. Now, I am not, as regular viewers will know, some kind of obsessive Blue Note fanboy. I think there's a lot to admire about Blue Note, but, you know, there were other labels which were more adventurous. There were other labels that sound a little better. There are other labels whose definition of jazz was maybe just a touch more diverse. On top of this, many of the greatest post-war jazz musicians make precious little dent on the Blue Note catalog, if at all. People like Ellington, Basie, Parker, Coltrane, a little bit here and there, Mingus, a little bit of Miles early on in the catalog, but a lot of the so-called greats are not to be found on Blue Note Records. I have a slightly unpopular opinion, I think, which is that I think that the scarcity and the cash value these days of original Blue Notes have kind of created some selective deafness uh, regarding the limitations of those recordings amongst the buying public, because of course, you know, if you spent 500 bucks or a thousand dollars on an original Blue Note pressing, of course it's going to sound fantastic, right? You're going to convince yourself it does, even if it doesn't. I'm not saying it doesn't, and of course it doesn't mean the record you bought, it's that other guy. Um, but still, I think there is a little bit of mental distortion happening. And as a consequence, there's this ever so slightly noticeable cult of obsessive collection, which can feel a little bit like baseball cards or comic books, in that the collectible thing is starting to somehow get away from the original purpose of what the actual thing was meant to do in your life. And before people think I'm just knocking other people, I myself have been carried away from time to time on this little wave. A further point is that while Blue Note's cultural and social importance is certainly undeniable, it's not the only label that ever poked a finger in the eye of the dominant paradigm. So all that to say, I'm making this video not in any way being what you might call a Blue Note completist. I think a moderate amount of Blue Note, I've got about 100 Blue Note records, but there are many hundred great Blue Note records. Uh, I think a moderate amount of Blue Note goes a long way. No one needs all that Hammond organ jazz, in my humble opinion. Uh, you'd also be forgiven if you got a bit confused and mixed up a lot of those hard bop sessions, those small combo sessions from the late 1950s, as good as they are. 
but I say all this just as a caveat for what's going to follow. I love Blue Note, and in general, I think Blue Note did a lot of things, and the things that they did, they did them very well. And the bottom line is, you are less likely to be disappointed by a random Blue Note record, certainly from their classic period of 54 to 66, than maybe the equivalent selection of any other jazz label in history. They're that good. There's something special about Blue Note, and it's not just the music, it's also the context in which it emerged and the ethos that the two founders brought to the music that they produced and distributed. Blue Note was, of course, founded by two German Jews who were fleeing Nazi oppression in the late 1930s. They went on to be, or to form, the label which maybe did as much as any label to advance the cause and the voice of a generation of black Americans who themselves, of course, were facing their own version of domestic racial oppression. Alfred Lyon and Frank Wolf both died relatively young, at least in today's terms. But if you ask a lot of the great musicians who played in those Blue Note records what they think of them subsequently, and there's lots of these kinds of videos, they don't remember these guys as campaigners. They simply remember them as extraordinarily decent people who loved jazz and who were willing to put the art form of jazz up above other economic considerations and who treated all of the musicians with respect and with decency. And that, that fundamental decency and commitment to the music above all is the essence of what the label was about. So how does this play out in terms of recorded content? Well, for instance, they're able to attract and to retain on contract for many, many years, practically a whole generation of excellent jazz musicians. True, the very biggest names were often recording for different labels, but you didn't get to record for Blue Note unless you really had something. And due to this incredible loyalty of all these great musicians, nobody other than Blue Note put out more high quality hard bop in the 1950s and 1960s. They put out hundreds and hundreds of great records, but interestingly, they didn't flood the market. They tended to have, and I don't have the exact numbers, again, this is where London Jazz Collector has some good information. They tended to have relatively small runs, something like 2,500 records you know, first pressing. And they would also hold many records back because they didn't want to flood the market. Fact is pissed off some of their artists at some point because you know they would record a bunch of records and sometimes they weren't released until the later 60s or into the 70s or even much later there's still some uh, blue notes still drip drip dripping onto the market the striking thing too about blue note and i mentioned this maybe already a little bit and i'll come back to the theme is that there's not much deadwood in their catalog impulse and columbia and verve and capital and pacific were all putting out great records in the late 1950s well actually not impulse but anyway the other ones were impulse were in the early 60s they were all putting out great records at the time um, but their catalogs are also peppered with a whole bunch of lower quality more commercial offerings that are slightly less or really not appealing at all to a serious jazz collector this is not the case with blue note in its classic era about the worst thing that happens on Blue Note, at least in my untutored opinion, is Alfred Lyon maybe going too far in indulging Art Blakey's penchant for these very drum-centered percussion records that he puts out. So not only is the music scarce, but it's predictably very good to excellent, and therefore it is expensive in its original form. Now, nothing good lasts forever. They had a remarkable run from about 54 to 66, and after that, when the original founders start to move off stage, the wheels begin to fall off, not consistently, and there are some real exceptions. But before we delve into the latter day story, let's go back to the origins. Alfred Lyon and Frank Wolf are both native Berliners. They were boyhood friends. They each managed to get out of Nazi Germany through different means before the war. Lyon leaves in 37, and Wolf actually leaves it pretty late in 1939. He had already had a photography career in Berlin. Lyon had not been a jazz professional impresario or producer, what have you, of any variety in Berlin, but he had become a major jazz fan. Both of them, in fact, had been jazz fans in Germany before the war, despite the Nazi ban on the music. As Wolf said, I couldn't follow the music, but I loved it. The Blue Note label, when it was originally founded in New York, is founded by Alfred Lyon with the assistance of a guy called Max Margulis, who's a communist. He's a writer. He would eventually uh, come under the scrutiny of McCarthy, um, but he was the guy who put up the seed money for the project in the first place. Uh, Frank Wolf then joins soon after. Margulis fades out of the picture. He's never really involved with the musical side of things, but he does write the label's so-called manifesto, uh, and I'll just read it here. Blue Note records are designed to serve the uncompromising expressions of hot jazz or swing. 
Direct and honest hot jazz is a way of feeling, a musical and social manifestation, and Blue Note Records are concerned with identifying its impulse, not its sensational and commercial adornments. So nothing sensational, nothing commercial, just uncompromising expression. The first releases before Lion gets drafted and goes off to the war are traditional hot jazz, boogie woogie, uh, people like Mead Lewis, like Ike Quebec, like Sidney Bichette, who had not been able to get deals with anybody else, but Lyon trusted his own ear, and I think we've all come to trust Alfred Lyon's ear. He also, from the very beginning, set about with an ethos of treating the musicians well, engaging them respectfully in how the session will be conducted and what the expectations were, finding out who the sidemen should be, and critically, paying for rehearsals, which most other labels were too cheap to do, and which very clearly comes through in how tight the combos are that he records later on. Lions in the Army from 41 to 43, which kind of takes the wind out of the label's sails and it just becomes kind of a back catalog operation that Wolf is keeping an eye on. Um, but he comes back and once again they pick up and they've got a very uncommercial approach. They wanted to record artists that they liked, particularly people that couldn't get deals anywhere and therefore were not that expensive to record, but nevertheless they would treat them well. People like Art Hodes, a piano player, another piano player, James P. Johnson. All of this was small group stuff, which was a hallmark of Blue Note, not just in the early days, but really all the way through the history of the label, this precious little, if any, maybe people can correct me, but I can't think of any Blue Note big band records as such. And that's not super accidental because they didn't have the money to land the big bands. But they had great taste, and crucially, they had a sense of where jazz was headed. Lyon, as I mentioned, was primarily the producer. Wolf was also involved in production, particularly after Lyon moves out of the picture in 1967. But Wolf's most lasting contribution, in my view, is his remarkable portfolio of these incredible black and white images of some of the great jazz musicians of the mid 20th century. And I think those images are part of most people's mental slideshow of what jazz was like at that particular period of time. The key thing that happens with Blue Note in terms of not only its own destiny, but the destiny of jazz in the post-war period is Lion getting his head around bebop. Previously, as I mentioned, they had been recording a lot of effectively traditional pre-war uh, swing type uh, jazz approaches. Ike Quebec, who was one of the guys that they had recorded, was following the whole emergence of the bebop scene on 52nd Street. And he introduces Lyon to this and Wolf to this. And for Alfred Lyon, there was one musician in particular who was a real revelation. He would say later on that there were three musicians he would record anytime, anywhere, as much as he could. So impressed was he with their musical talent and just what they had to say. They were all piano players. Uh, one of them was Herbie Nichols, whom, of course, he does eventually record. I've got this uh, uh, re-release of, of what were originally a couple of 10-inch records. Um, the prophetic Herbie Nichols. Herbie Nichols is one. Another, of course, is Andrew Hill, um, who again, like Nichols, would appear later on in Blue Note's catalog. But the person who really rocked Lion's World initially and changed the whole direction of the label was, of course, Thelonious Monk. Uh, and this is um, the one of the compilations of some of the recordings that Monk has up. There we are. Genius of Modern Music, uh, Volume 1. There's another one. These are basically compilations of the music that Monk made for Blue Note between 1947 and 1952. In the late 40s and 50s, Blue Note also recorded other cutting-edge jazz by people like Tad Dameron, by Howard McGee, by Bud Powell. There are also excellent recordings of J.J. Johnson, the trombonist, and, of course, of Miles Davis. And here is... Uh, Again, this is Miles and really his, some of his earlier developments. This is uh, a bunch of stuff that he was uh, releasing was well, a compilation of things that he recorded in 1952, 53, and 1954. And of course, though, long before he reaches the stature of his Columbia years. Most of these records were released as 10-inch LPs um, because, of course, the 10-inch was the primary long player vehicle between 1950 and 1954, 55. The advent of the 12-inch LP in 1955 coincides with a sudden coming to prominence of a new subgenre of modern jazz, uh, an evolution of bebop called hard bop. And hard bop and Blue Note and their stories are basically inseparable, such as the impact of the one on the other. But before I talk about hard bop, I want to just take a couple of seconds to talk about the man who recorded so much hard bop, the Blue Note, of course, Rudy Van Gelder. <laughs> 
By January 1953, Rudy Van Gilder had a home recording studio set up in his parents' living room in Hackensack, New Jersey. And he had a lot of good equipment. He was an optometrist. He was a very technically minded guy, and he'd acquired some great microphones and other good equipment with the resources that he had at the time while still working as an optometrist, but he wasn't really known in the wider musical world. He was basically recording for local talent, as he puts it, recording local ladies from Hackensack who sang opera. While he did this, he experimented to get the kinds of sounds that he wanted to hear and that he thought would sound good reproduced on the record playing equipment of the day and the radios of the day and so on. In particular, he experimented with microphone placement and compression to get a very punchy sound out of horns, trumpets, saxophones, and so on. In walks a guy called Gil Melly, who's a tenor sax player, needs to cut some songs, and he records four tracks with Van Gilder, and he takes these tracks and he goes to meet Alfred Lyon, and he plays them, uh, and Lyon says, this is fantastic, I want to put these out as singles. And so he does so, and then he says, and I want to sign you to a contract and have you record more music. So. Lion and Melly and Melly's musicians go off to WOR radio station, which was the studio where Lion was at that time recording for Bluno. And Lion says to the studio engineer, make these guys sound like these records that I just put out. And the engineer says, oh, no can do, but you can always go to the guy who originally recorded these. Maybe he can help you out. And that is how Alfred Lion ends up meeting Rudy Van Gelder. And not only does he like Van Gilder's sound, they have a great meeting of the minds just about how one prepares for a recording session, expectations, and so on, and they were very, very much in sync. Van Gilder goes on to have a 20-plus year relationship with Blue Note, where he's practically the exclusive provider of recording services to the label. Uh, he also became a go-to guy for lots of other labels like Savoy and like Prestige, but Blue Note were always his most special clients. As I said, he and Alfred were on the same page sonically, Alfred would also rehearse, which appealed to Rudy's slightly obsessive uh, personality. He would know in advance what he wanted, which suited Rudy. And Rudy also observed that the other labels were watching what Blue Note did. People like Prestige, Bob Weinstock at Prestige would watch what Blue Note did and copy it. So he had no difficulty experimenting with new technologies, new equipment, new approaches with recordings for Prestige or Savoy and only when it was perfected, applying those techniques to a Blue Note recording. The overall effect of bringing Rudy on board takes Blue Note really to the first rank of record labels at the time in terms of sound quality, and even the casual listener, I think, can detect an audible shift between the pre-Rudy recordings, say, up to, say, the winter of 52, 53, and then what happens afterward, the quality of Blue Note recordings for the next, well, 20 years anyway. I have to say, however, that Rudy and the sound that he gets for Blue Note is not without its critics and without controversy. And I'll discuss that a little bit later when I'm talking about suggestions for collectors. Let's talk a little bit about hard bop. This is a style of music which had a lot in common with bebop, but it also has some characteristics which set it apart. It tends to be slower, generally speaking, and more melodic, I would say, than bebop. It draws much more heavily on the blues than bebop does, and largely thanks to Art Blakey, who is a major figure in the history of drummer, it features a backbeat with a rhythm on two and four. Hard Bop 2 was not just a musical transition, now this is slightly less tangible, but listening to interviews of a lot of the people who were in the middle of it, it was more socially conscious as a musical movement. It was more assertively black music in a time of great anger and great frustration at the slow pace of social change. It shows up in album titles, it shows up in the album art, it shows up in a lot of the titles of the compositions, and one thing to note too about Blue Note is how much more original composition there is in the label, in part because they were able to rehearse. Blue Note was not the only label developing hard bop in 1954, 1955. Prestige is also doing this. Miles is busy innovating uh, while he's with that label, uh, Riverside too. But Blue Note was, I think, inarguably, the label which produces the largest amount of high quality hard bop records. These records, after 1956, came inside the sleeve designs of the great Reed Miles, the commercial artist who contributes so much to the look and feel of Blue Note Records after he's hired by the label. Here's a few examples. So this is Joe Henderson's great record, page one. This is, when did this come out? Uh, 19, oh, was it 65? Where are we at? I should know this. 
Um, anyway, something like that. But, but look at that. That is such a modern image. It is a very assertive and modern image of a black musician in a way that you would not have found record labels or, or record covers showing even a few years before. It's a very modern, striking image. A classic uh, Reed Miles design. You the Hips uh, record with Zoot Sims. A lot of the graphic imagery and graphic design of the 1960s is a reflection of the influence of Reed Miles and people like him. Uh, some other examples are Jackie McLean, I think, got some of the best of this. This is a bit shiny, but this is one of the tone poets. Um, but that's an amazing cover. Uh, it's time. Another uh, great Jackie McLean cover, Let Freedom Ring. And uh, make a nice trifecta here, uh, Destination Out. So again, if you think about, you know, think of, you know, the who and, you know, their buttons and t-shirts and their sort of visual imagery, a lot of that, funnily enough, comes back to the risks that were taken by people like Reed Miles in designing these very assertive and frankly exciting looking record covers. I think it's probably not an exaggeration to say that Reed Miles, in his own way, is as responsible for the look of late 50s and 60s design as people like Mary Quant, the designer of the miniskirt, or Piet Mondrian, or Frank Lloyd Wright, or people like that. All of these folks create this look and feel of the 1960s, and I don't think you can leave Reed Miles out of that conversation. I mentioned earlier there was a lot of loyalty to Blue Note amongst a cohort of musicians. There wasn't actually a house band, but there really are a number of people who are such mainstays of Blue Note that there might as well have been a house band. And there really are two champions, or probably more than two, but two anyway who stand out to me in those early years as champions of hard bop. And those are, of course, the drummer Art Blakey and the pianist Horace Silver. They've been working together since the early 1950s, building a sound based in part on Blakey's beat, in part on some of the great compositions that Silver was coming up with. It was typically in a small combo setting, four or five musicians. And together they released a bunch of records for Blue Note between 1954 and 1956, some of which are under Silver's name, some of which are under Blakey's name, or under the collective known as the Jazz Messengers. There's a few of them here, so this is... Uh, uh, this is actually one of the earlier, not quite an original, but a very early pressing I have, Blue Note 1518, which is Horace Silver and the Jazz Messengers, uh, which has a whole bunch of great stuff and includes uh, the lineup on these, on all of these early Blue Notes. It's just amazing. Kenny Dorham on trumpet, Hank Mobley, the great, somewhat underappreciated Hank Mobley on tenor sax, Horace Silver on piano, uh, Doug Watkins on bass, and Art Blakey on drums, an early version of the Jazz Messengers. Um, Here's a trio record, actually, which, uh, which Silver and uh, Blakey and others uh, produced. Uh, I think, actually, this might be a compilation. Yeah, it is of a whole series of recordings around this time. Um, anyway, and there's a bunch of records also that come out under, under uh, Blakey's name as well. This group, Jazz Messengers, as they came to be known, um, is generally considered to be ground zero for Heart Bop, and its various sidemen are wall-to-wall -wall jazz legends. Clifford Brown, Lou Donaldson, Percy Heath, I mentioned Hank Mobley and Kenny Dorham, Curtis Russell, Doug Watkins. Soon enough, this group, after a couple of years putting out amazing music, go their separate ways, due primarily to Silver's distaste for the whole heroin scene that always seemed to surround Blakey in those years. But crucially for Blue Note, Silver still stays with the label. So now Blakey and Silver, after 1956, are both recording as leaders prolifically for Blue Note. So here's a few of the uh, of, of the products of that. Here's a, a live record that Silver did uh, at the Village Gate, which is pretty dandy. Here is a very early pressing of uh, Art Blakey's, uh, Art Blakey inherited the name Jazz Messengers for his groups you know, that followed uh, Mosaic, a real classic. It's uh, his title track, and actually really there's nothing but wall-to-wall -wall classics on this particular record. Uh, another uh, great outing by Blakey uh, live at uh, Birdland, Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers at Night in Tunisia. Again, another timeless record that spawned all kinds of standards, in particular the title track. Six Pieces of Silver by Horace Silver, um, a really great record, uh, finger popping, one of my, one of my favorites is Horace. 
waving out of the car, I presume in Central Park. Uh, those are all very early pressings. Um, this is a, a tone poet of uh, further explorations. This comes around the same time. This is the iteration of Silver's group, which has Art Farmer on trumpet, which is a very nice version. Silver stays with Blue Note for decades. And some of the stuff he does later on, this isn't that much later on, but it is absolutely classic, uh, include uh, this just terrific record, one of my favorite Blue Note records of all time, the Song for My Father, which is a record which really comes from the heart for Horace. Uh, as you can imagine, that's his dad in the cover. And the compositions on here are, are just remarkable. So Horace Silver is a major, major part, as is Art Blakey, of the quality and the success of Blue Note in those early hard bop years. I'd mentioned Hank Mobley just now, and you can't really mention Silver and Blakey without also mentioning Hank Mobley, because the three of them, separately or together, produced so much of that early canon of Blue Note hard bop. Here's a classic outing by Mobley himself. Uh, Soul Station, this is a, one of those Kevin Gray, uh, I think an uh, 80th anniversary or, or a Blue Note classics or whatever it is, um, Belize. Just really an unstoppably great, unfathomably great record. And I find Mobley fascinating because I find his work as a sideman is often as good or better than his contributions as a leader. He was on a total of something like 60 Blue Notes. Silver was on either as a leader or as a sideman on some 50. And Blakey appears as a leader or a sideman on something like 70 Blue Note records. So you can see how, I mean, yeah, there are several hundred really good Blue Notes. But there are an awful lot of those that have one or two or all three of those players on the recording. In fact, if you take the best records of Mobley, Silver, and Blakey, you arguably have the core of any truly legit hard bop collections, and those records alone would be tough for any other label to top, at least in terms of hard bop. And it's with those artists, I would say, that any sort of serious strategy of collecting Blue Note records probably needs to begin with those artists. Mobley is especially sought after, partly, I think, because a lot of his records are fairly rare and anything original or even close to original with him on it is going to be expensive. Now, of course, it's not all about Silver and Blakey and Mobley. There are lots and lots and lots of great artists who grace the Blue Note stage between 1954 and the mid-1960s. There are some big names that I've either mentioned in passing or just ever so slightly or not at all. Uh, Herbie Nichols, Sonny Clark, Dexter Gordon, Kenny Burrell, Jackie McLean, in particular, we saw some of his great album covers earlier, Donald Byrd, Lou Donaldson. And there are also a few spectacular cameos on the label by artists that aren't necessarily completely associated with Blue Note, people like Sonny Rollins, John Coltrane, with, of course, his one and only record for Blue Note, Blue Train, uh, Miles Davis, Cannonball Adderley, in fact, their basically jointly led record, Something Else, which comes out, I think, in 1960 and many, many other records by lesser names, out of whom Blue Note was routinely able to bring the best. As the decade turns from the 50s to the 60s, and as the 60s wear on, hard bop is still there. It's always really there one way or another in Blue Note's catalog, probably most notably in the 60s in Lee Morgan's uh, efforts. This is the sidewinder of Japanese pressing, as you can tell, uh, arguably, well, I don't know if it's his best record from the 1960s because the earlier stuff he did was probably a bit less commercial than this, but this was a great seller for him and, in fact, really bailed the label out of a minor economic hole at one point because it was such a popular record. The title track uh, continues as an enduring piece of music. You still hear it all the time to this day. Lee Morgan carried the hard bop flag all the way through the 1960s, but there are other sounds that are creeping into Blue Note's production at this point Soul jazz, for instance, probably most comprehensively articulated through Lou Donaldson's work and his evolution through the 1960s. Modal jazz, there's a whole bunch of folks who are Miles Davis's 1960s protégés or associates, um, people like, uh, for instance, Wayne Shorter. Um, here's, this is Wayne's uh, wonderful, wonderful record, Speak No Evil. Uh, another great example of this is uh, Herbie Hancock's record, Empyrean Isles with the great and very much sampled track Cantaloupe Island on it. And finally, there was music which was more or less avant-garde. Now, of course, the 60s was a time for a lot of really quite out there avant-garde jazz. You don't get much of that on Blue Note in this period, and certainly very little of the no-holds-barred free jazz 
and avant-garde stuff that you might have heard on Impulse, you know, the work of John Coltrane in his later years on Impulse, Pharaoh Sanders, Archie Shep, you don't get that absolutely, you know, unrestrained ripping on Blue Note, but you do get some pretty avant-garde stuff and some of the best examples and very well-regarded records there too, uh, include Eric Dolphy's terrific record, uh, Out to Lunch, which has some real, well, some real cutting edge players on here, Richard Davis in particular on bass, it's rarely a record that was put out that has Richard Davis on it that isn't excellent. And Bobby Hutchison, who also went in a quite avant-garde direction on the vibes, others are on that. Probably the most out there artist that Blue Note recorded on a reasonably regular basis, or at least an occasional basis, Cecil Taylor. This is his record, Conquistador, um, not entirely for the faint of heart. Larry Young's wonderful record, Unity. Again, look at that cover. I and mean, this is what I mean when I say that Reed Miles is affecting what the 1960s looked like. And this piece by Gratian Monker, the third evolution, which is kind of a funny story because and I forget all the details, but as I understand it, for some reason or other, Alfred Lyon wasn't able to be there during the original recording session. And uh, let's just say they got away with a lot more avant garde than they might otherwise have done had Alfred been there. But uh, it's a good thing they did because this really is an excellent record uh, with uh, Lee Morgan on trumpet uh, as well, taking a bit of a detour from his regular hard bop duties. So Blue Note had built its name on this incredible hard bop that was wonderfully packaged and were beginning in the 1960s to diversify, not necessarily because it was Alfred Lyon's personal taste to do so, because he was always kind of a mainstream jazz fan, but because he felt a degree of obligation to reflect what was happening in jazz. So soul jazz was coming in, so avant-garde jazz was coming in, and things are pretty rosy, but then Alfred Lyon has a heart attack in 1966. And while he's recovering, Liberty Records, a much bigger operation, makes a pitch to buy Blue Note. And Lyon and his wife are both anxious about his health going forward and the stress of running a label. And they decide, well, maybe this is all in the cards. And they agree. Uh, and he sells the label to Liberty Records. And Liberty cuts a deal for him and Frank Wolf to stick around. But Alfred really can't hack working in a corporate environment, having been essentially supremo of all things musical in the label for 20 odd years. And he decides that's it. And in 1967, he retires for good. Wolf stays on and he brings in Duke Pearson, the piano player and the arranger to assist him with the A&R stuff and, and the production duties. But the inevitable nature of being bought out by a more corporate entity with a greater focus on selling records and what was popular and what was selling and so on starts to bring different pressures to A&R choices, to production choices, to musical so the choices of musical style. And very quickly, it becomes apparent from the catalog, there's still good things that are happening, but other things begin to happen, which are clearly much more commercial directions and are taking Blue Note a long way from what had been its sweet spot of hard bop. Now, there are some great records put out by Blue Note after the Liberty buyout in 1966, and even after the United Artists buyout in 1971. But hard bop was no longer selling. And there was a lot of push, as I mentioned, to get more commercial. Soul jazz starts to sell in a big, big way. And in the 1970s, after Frank Wolf dies, Pearson leaves and then in come the Mizell brothers, who are a big jazz funk production duo. And the soul and the funky jazz really start to dominate, or at least take a major place in the catalog at the time. This period is kind of controversial amongst jazz fans, Blue Note fans, collectors, and so on. It's often portrayed as a big commercial sellout where Blue Note abandons, you know, the heights of artistic purity and integrity and starts to try and sell records to keep up uh, with, with, uh, with pop music and so on. Um, I have a slightly different take. I get that people who love the hard bop stuff from 1955 to 65, as I do, a lot of those folks regretted at the time and continue to regret the switch of focus. But in my humble opinion, that view is a consequence of four other distinct but related views. First, there is the frustration, understandable, over the abandonment, apparently, of a great art form. Secondly, I think it comes from a fairly constrained 
definition, a contained definition of what constitutes good jazz. Third, I think there is a bit of nostalgia over the loss of what had been a really clear identity for Blue Note. And fourth, I think for some who hold this opinion, there is just a discomfort and a distaste for fat, funky beats. I think what one needs to bear in mind is that party was not going to continue forever. The market for mainstream jazz, for hard bop, was drying up. There are lots of reasons for that, but the big ones were Motown, Soul, Funk, James Brown, people like that. Black jazz musicians by the late 60s were playing for a dwindling and, importantly, an increasingly white audience. The black musical market had abandoned jazz in favor of other musical genres, and this was not lost in the people who were playing the music. And many jazz musicians in the late 60s, as Lou Donaldson had been doing kind of organically, made the decision to move closer towards the music, which was popular or more popular with black listeners at the time. Donald Byrd is a great example of this. Um, and whether it's Donald Byrd, here's an example of one of his records from uh, the early 70s, uh, Street Lady, which is a great, great record. I have a very silly version of it, which is, which is lime green, and I'm not doing that again. But the music is terrific on that. Or another one of my favorites, uh, the great uh, flute player, Bobby Humphrey, who puts out a string, quite good records, I got to say, for Blue Note in the early 70s with the Mizells at the controls. For me, I love this music and sort of similar stuff that was coming out on, on Kudu and CTI and others. I love this music as much as I love the earlier stuff. And so for me, there are still plenty of great moments after these buyouts. It's not a total disaster. It is a switch of focus. And it wasn't as if Blue Note could really control the terms of that switch of focus as much as people might have felt they could. However, even in purest jazz terms, there are some great records that come out in the post-buyout phase on Blue Note. I've reviewed some of them already, like uh, McCoy Tyner's Expansions. Uh, Horace Silver kept putting out great music. Sam Rivers put some great music out. Uh, this is a particularly excellent record, which is a collaboration between Bobby Hutchison and Harold Land. Uh, this is called San Francisco, and it's just superb. I think this is, what, 69 or no, 1971 when this came out. A real highlight, not just in the post-buyout phase, but in the whole Blue Note catalog. But all this said, eventually, Blue Note really does wither away and decline. It's bought by United Artists in 1971. That's the same year that Frank Wolf dies. So the link between Wolf and Lion and Blue Note is pretty much severed. Obviously, in Wolf's case, permanently severed at that point. Duke Pearson leaves. Um, the Mizells come in. The whole shebang was bought by EMI in 1979. He shut down the label and kind of turned it into a back catalog venture for a few years. There were a few peaks after the label was revived a bit in 1984. McCoy Tyner had some great late stage uh, career pieces. John Schofield, Nora Jones, you know, chart dominating uh, debut and, and subsequent work. And then the whole acid jazz sort of sampling phenomenon which takes over in the early 90s and in particular sparked by the Us 3 record Hand in the Tort which was entirely built on sampling the Blue Note catalog and Blue Note decided Don Waz just decided to throw open the doors to these guys and in doing so revive interest in the label which of course they did. For collectors however the greatest interest that resides in the label's contemporary activity um, has to do with its reissues in particular its audiophile reissues. There were Originally, those Rudy Van Gelder remastering series, uh, a, a lot of classic titles, which he had another run at. Um, the somewhat derided 75th anniversary series, I'm unlucky to have a few of those, although frankly, they're not that bad. And then the spectacular Tone Poet and the classic vinyl and the 80th anniversary series, mostly, if not all, remastered by the estimable Kevin Gray of Coherent Audio and the remarkable things he's done there. So how to summarize all this without falling down rabbit holes or falling down the same rabbit holes that I've probably gone down already in the video? Well, to be clear, some rabbit holes are pretty fun to fall down, and I encourage you to do so. But the comments that I'm going to make now are really geared to somebody who, as I said at the outset of the video, is just starting out on their journey of collecting Blue Note records. And I'll begin with what I think are some general truths about Blue Note. First of all, when you're buying Blue Note records, there's a magic decade, or really a magic 12 years. Records that were originally made in the Alfred Lyon years when the label was embracing hard bop between 1954 and 1966. These are uncontroversially the greatest years 
in the label's history. A second general truth about Blue Note is that if what you're looking for are small group performances by players who know each other very well and are all committed to kind of cohesive hard bop sound, then Blue Note is a label for you. In those years of 54 to 66, the typical Blue Note release is a hard bop date featuring a quartet or a quintet, several of the players being regular, and by which I mean recurring on, on dozens and dozens of Blue Note records, Blakey, Silver, Mobley, Sonny Clark, Lee Morgan, Donald Byrd, Paul Chambers, all jazz legends, all incredibly high quality players. And so the music is typically impeccable. If you just randomly grab a Blue Note record from this period, it might be a little bit avant-garde if we get to the 1960s, but more often than not, it's going to be a series of blues-inspired originals and some ballads and a few covers. A third general truth about Blue Note is the Rudy sound. The sound quality will be very good. It will be very immediate sounding. There will be very, very punchy horns that sound like they're being played right in front of you. Rudy's treatment of bass and drums, and in particular piano, receives less than universal acclaim. But it's not all about Rudy, I have to say. As others have pointed out, Rudy achieved different sounds for other producers, people like Bob Thiel uh, for Impulse and Creed Taylor for Verve. So the Blue Note sound is as much Alfred Lyon's preference as it is what Rudy was necessarily bringing to the recording studio. In any event, the result is the Blue Note sound. You know it when you hear it, and that's typically speaking what you're going to get when you pull a random Blue Note record off the shelf. The fourth general truth is that the music is going to be mostly mainstream. Blue Note's music was consistently high quality in artistic merit uh, throughout that period. In 1954, the hard bop stuff was kind of the cutting edge, but Lion's taste didn't evolve as fast as the jazz world was evolving at that time. That's not a real criticism because the jazz world was evolving very, very quickly. And by the time we get into the 1960s, I won't say that Lyons' conservatism was holding the label back, that would be an overstatement, but it didn't allow him to explore the further fringes of the music in the way that other labels were willing to do so and other labels were willing to gamble. And that's how you get some of the spectacular mid-career stuff that Coltrane does on, on uh, Impulse. I don't know that he could necessarily have done that on Blue Note, although that's a counterfactual we'll never know the answer to. A fifth general truth about collecting Blue Note is that Pre-1954, you probably should be a little bit picky. There are some real gems, um, but you shouldn't expect the sound quality to be as good because, of course, Rudy was not the engineer and, and Alfred was dealing with much more generic circumstances. There are lots and lots of pre-war styles which may or may not be to your taste. And so, um, by all means, investigate Blue Note prior to 1954, but do a bit of research into the styles of music and the players. Don't assume that it's naturally going to be of the same quality and the same style of music as things which happen after that point. The same is true, I guess, for the sixth and last general truth, which is that the music after 1966 is hit or miss. The quality starts to vary. More commercial records start to creep in. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's definitely a thing. The range of styles, once again, expands outwards in this period as the label's looking more for sales and less to sort of follow one person's artistic taste and vision. You can't really predict the style or the quality of a Blue Note record just from the label alone after 1966, as you could in those years in between during the great years of the label 54 to 66. And as of the period before 1954, if you're at a record fair and you see a record which was recorded after 1966, you should probably do a bit more research before you just grab it on site. I said I would do a little bit on sound quality when I was talking about Rudy earlier in the video, and I will now do that. Just a few caveats in advance. First of all, I'm not what you would call a serious audiophile. By that, I mean somebody who gets up and changes the cartridge on the record multiple times uh, in, in a setting or has a lot of those 45 RPM reissues. I personally, I like sitting on the couch and listening to music a lot more than I like you know, getting up and down to deal with that kind of stuff. Um, we all have our deal breakers in terms of sound quality. It's true, but I would say I'm probably in the 70th or 75th percentile of, of caring about uh, audio quality, not in the 99th. So that's me, just so you know. The second caveat is my Blue Note collection is of moderate size. There are three to 400 Blue Note records that are generally accepted to be pretty good, and I have not heard all of them. I may not even have heard half, I probably have heard about half of those. I have about 100 Blue Notes. 
um, nowhere near the level of completism that I have exhibited with respect to uh, contemporary records or impulse. So there are a lot of Blue Note records that I haven't heard. But that said, as I mentioned, there are a lot of recurring artists on Blue Note. I have three Jimmy Smith records. Jimmy Smith, of course, is king of the Hammond organ on Blue Note. I've got three of his records. I've heard enough from those records to know that I will be pretty selective about the other 37 records that he made for Blue Note. And while I would probably love in a perfect world to have everything that Lee Morgan and Horace Silver and Donald Byrd and Hank Mobley recorded for the label, I also have other collecting ambitions which are not restricted to Blue Note. And I don't want to have 10,000 records. I feel like I have a reasonably good sampling of the label. I'm going to continue to add different titles that I want, but I don't feel a need to collect it all simply because there is so much redundancy is the wrong word, but a lot of people on the label record a lot of records for the label and you don't necessarily have them all to have, get a sense of their contribution. A third caveat is that for economic reasons, which hopefully all will understand, only a small percentage of my blue notes are true Lion era releases, by which I mean records were actually issued in or before 1966. I have, I think, 13 pre-1967 titles. I've got five that are actually from the 1950s. I don't have any of the Lexingtons, that this is the the labels that actually have the Lexington Avenue address. I don't have any of those. I've thought about buying a Lexington uh, issue once or twice, but then thought better of it. I've got some Japanese pressings. I've got about 30 Kevin Gray remasters. Bless him. I've got a couple dozen, sadly enough, from the 75th anniversary, quite a few 70s reissues, smattering of odds and sods, and so on. Um, so my listening to early Blue Note pressings is limited to, as I say, about a dozen records. But for reasons which I think should be obvious, I'm not alone in that because it's pretty freaking expensive to be in a position to listen to a lot of early pressings. Now, there's a lot that you can read about the sound quality of Blue Notes. The conventional wisdom, and I'm not trying to you know, really undermine this, is that the earliest pressings of anything Van Gelder recorded and mastered for the label sound best, which is great in theory. But in practice, if you try and buy a pristine listening copy of an OG Blue Note from 1958 or 59, with very few exceptions, you are into hundreds, if not thousands of dollars for that record. So unless you are independently wealthy or you have wealthy friends, the chances are you are never going to listen to a near mint or a very good plus first 1957 pressing of Blue Note 1560, which is Hank Mobley's Hank, which is a great record, but you're not going to get anywhere near an OG of that. I never have, and I likely never will. So this typically means for a collector that you're going to try and find an acceptable reissue, the best of which are probably the Kevin Gray remasterings where they have been done of back issues in recent years. But of course, that's never as good as the original. Or is it? One of the keys, of course, is in the mastering. Now, Rudy used to master his records hot with compressed sound and significantly boosted to higher end. You get this very punchy horn sound. He did this so they'd sound great playing out of these old record players. They'd sound great leaping out of the speakers of radios and in, in bars and so on. But personally, I find some of his work, when I listen to the early pressings of the ones that I have, kind of hard to listen to, like my copy, which I just showed you, of Blakey's Mosaic, which is a first stereo pressing of that album. On side one, especially Wayne Shorter's sax in particular, kind of sets my teeth on edge, uh, which has everything to do with the engineering and not Wayne's sound, because Wayne Shorter's saxophone sound is something typically I think is fantastic. Other people have expressed his same opinion in a different way, and they'll say it's hard to play Rudy Van Gelder's records loud because of the compression, because of this phenomenon. Now, that's not always the case. My copy, this, the uh, Horace Silver and the Jazz Messenger is the blue one with, with Horace holding up three fingers that I showed you earlier. That one sounds really, really good. But in general, and this isn't too radical an opinion, my own view is that Kevin Gray's remastering work has generally improved the listenability of Rudy's originals. In life, we have choices. You can chase and pay for early pressings, and many of those will sound amazing. It's true. But if the sound and the music is really what matters to you more than collecting trophies, I think there's a case to be made that in many cases, Blue Notes have never sounded better than they have sounded on the Tone Poet, on the Classic Vinyl, or on the 80th Anniversary Reissue Series. So that's my soapbox piece on that. But if nevertheless you want to chase at least one of those old Blue Notes just to have an old deep groove record um, with the original logo and the 
original ancient addresses and so on, which is kind of fun to do. Here are some things to bear in mind. First of all, what's important is that it is an original Lion era pressing. It doesn't necessarily have to be a first pressing. Some later pressings from this era that still exist within that time band of 54 to 66 are pretty good. The key factor is seeing Rudy Van Gelder's stamp or etching in the dead wax, showing that he actually did the metalwork. And in fact, it doesn't just apply to that period because Rudy was also involved in mastering a lot of later reissues into the 1970s in particular. And so if you see, even on some of those funky, weird, dark blue, uh, blue note labels with the black note and all the rest of it, uh, even on those, if you see Rudy's initials or his name in the dead wax, that is a pretty good indicator that that is going to be a good sounding record. The second thing that will help you determine whether a record is valuable and searchable outable is the label and blue note has a variety of iterations of its label which typically are differentiated amongst other ways by the address which starts with the lexington avenue address and then the 47th avenue address and then the west 63rd address and then it just gets shortened to new york usa um, but you have to bear in mind that blue note would often re keep and reuse old labels with defunct addresses so the lineup of the address with the particular era isn't always neat and tidy as it should be. Third, there are some other physical markers beyond the label which are going to be important in determining the age and value of the record, um, two of which in particular are quite important for price, if not necessarily for sound quality. Uh, first is the lack of a ridge around the record, around the very perimeter of the record. Uh, in early pressings, say 54, 55, that's just flat. A more obvious one that people are more used to seeing is the so-called deep groove which i'll show you this is uh, again six pieces of silver i'll show you the deep groove on this this is a 1959 i think and you should be able to see the deep groove just uh, surrounding or about a third of the way into the label it's on both sides of this particular uh, release but um that can vary my rule of thumb with with deep groove is that it usually exists up until 1963 but then not much thereafter Blue Note's a bit weird because sometimes in the early 60s, you'll have a record that's deep groove on one side and not deep groove on the other side. You also have the introduction of non-deep groove stampers quite early into the, in the early 1960s, subsequent to which you will find later records that have deep groove. So it's not entirely an even sort of dividing point between deep groove old, non-deep groove new, as there might be for some other labels. Another feature which is noted by collectors is showing this really is a Lion Era issue is the presence of the so-called Plastilite ear, or P, uh, in, the, uh, in the dead wax. I'll show you a photograph of it here. This is essentially the stylized logo of the pressing plant Plastilite, which made all of Blue Notes records between the early 50s and the mid-1960s. In combination, the label, the Plastilite ear, Usually the presence of deep groove will tell you about the age of the record, but they don't independently in and of themselves tell you anything about the sound quality. That is conveyed pretty much exclusively by the presence of the Rudy Van Gelder stamp in the dead wax, either RVG or his full name or sometimes RVG stereo. And of course, when I say stamp, sometimes his initials are etched. Once you get past the buyout, Division of Liberty pressings are actually normally pretty good, especially when, as they usually would, they've got Rudy's stamp. 70s reissues can be hit or miss, um, but again, if Rudy did the mastering, have a look for that. If you see his stamp, uh, grab it, no matter how weird or funky the label looks. Beyond this, I don't know that there are any really hard and fast rules. I think you need to do your research. There are some pressings, generally speaking, people feel you should avoid. Many of the capital EMI, Pathé, French pressings from the 1980s are not held in, in uh, great regard. And of course, there's a much maligned 75th anniversary series, although again, not all of those are that bad. And I personally didn't understand how much I was supposed to dislike those until I, until I read about them on the internet. So there you go. Japanese pressings can be very good, but are not consistently so. Do your research. Um, and so I guess the bottom line to all of this is if it's not a Kevin Gray or a Van Gelder mastering effort, more research is probably required. The final piece of information with respect to collecting Blue Note has to do with catalog numbers, which are quite meaningful in the case of Blue Note, as we'll see. 
The two big series, which I think indisputably contain most of the music, which would be considered to be the best music that Blue Note ever put out, and where all the collector's fuss is focused, are the 1500 series and the 4000 series. The 1500 series has 100 releases in it, or pretty close anyway, I don't know if all the numbers were used. It runs from 1501 to 1600, it starts in 1955 and goes until 1958. Uh, the last one, I think, is the Three Sounds debut record. All of the 1500 series are mono until you get to release number 1562, at which point most records get a mono and a stereo release, but that's not always a given. Now, when it comes to what's actually in the 1500 series, the first few releases of the 1500 series contain some of the reissues of stuff that was done earlier on. It came out on 10 inches or whatever, because remember, 1955 is the beginning of the 12 inch LP era. So a lot of companies did a lot of reissuing around this time. But for the most part, what's on the 1500 series is wall to wall, absolutely classic, very collectible, very listenable, just delightful hard bop, including some of the greatest work in the label's entire catalog. It is pretty hard to go wrong with the 1500 series release. There are a few acquired tastes in there, like, as I mentioned, Blakey's more percussion heavy records, but in general, you see one, grab it. The other really important series to know in Blue Note is the 4000 series. This begins right after the conclusion of the 1500 series. It starts in 1958 and goes from release number 4001, which was a record by Sonny Rollins, to somewhere in the 4400s. Uh, I think I've written down 4435. Um, but the last dozen or so are kind of archival releases and compilations. The last release of new music on the 4000 series occurs in 1972. And that is released 4423, Gene Harris of the Three Sounds. Now, all of the 1500 series, whether they're mono or they're stereo, just have the four digit uh, 1500 series number. When they get to the 4000 series, a stereo release will have an eight stuck in front of the four digit uh, catalog number. As with the 1500 series, for the most part, the 4000 series records are very, very good. Some people, as discussed, feel the musical quality begins to fall away in the last 150 titles or so. But for me, I really do believe that that is as much a matter of musical preference as it is of the inherent quality of that music. So those are the two you really need to look out for and you should focus on. There are some other series which I'll mention here, um, which are of interest. So there's the 5000 series. That was the bulk of the labels output from the early 1950s. It's all monos, a mixture of proto, hard bop, bebop, traditional jazz. The BNLA series follows the conclusion of the 4000 series in the early 1970s. It runs until the label is wound up as an active maker of music used for the first time in 1979. And here things do get a bit patchy. There's new stuff, some that's really good, some that's of variable quality. There's some compilations, some live recordings, some archival releases, and typically not recorded or mastered by Rudy. Anything with an LT catalog follows the EMI buyout in 1979 when they shut down new production. These are therefore exclusively archival releases of things that Rudy had recorded in the 1950s and 1960s and Alfred Lyon had kept in the can. And some of it, understandably, is very, very good, like Lee Morgan's Sonic Boom, Donald Byrd's Chant, a whole bunch of great records which were just sitting there on tape until they were released. They're definitely worth picking up for the most part, because Lion kept a lot of good stuff back, not because it wasn't good, but because he just didn't want to flood the market because he had other records out there by the same artist. And finally, two of this series sort of of note, the 1200 series is a very limited set of releases from the later 1950s of some of the traditional jazz, some of the earliest stuff um, that they had released. And the 7000 series also appears in the 1950s. It's repackaged music from the very early years of the label, which had originally been released on 78s. This video is already way longer than I meant it to be, so I'm going to sum up my thoughts as quickly as I can. And the best way I can do that is with a tortured automotive analogy. So there are some Rolls-Royce musicians out there, and there are some Rolls-Royce albums. And if you ask jazz fans to name one real Rolls-Royce of a jazz record that they adore above all others, chances are that one record they're going to pick is not going to be a Blue Note record, strangely enough. The, the records which are commonly cited as the greatest jazz records of all time are, are often records on other labels, or commonly records in other labels. Similarly, if you ask jazz fans 
say who is the Rolls Royce of jazz musicians? Who is the jazz musician up to whom all other jazz musicians um, should look and who you think is the most amazing person to ever play a note? It is likely that the responses would include lots of people who rarely have ever recorded for Blue Note Records. But while Blue Note Records and their most frequently recorded musicians may not top straw polls like these, pretty much every record they put out, if not the Rolls-Royce example, pretty much every record they put out was a Jaguar. There is an expectation of musical quality, of technical quality, of artistic quality, of attention to detail, of, of the presence of original songwriting, of rehearsal, of tightness to the performance, and just an overall luxury performance um, on a Blue Note record, uh, which means that you can rarely go wrong by putting one on the turntable. And however you choose to engage with Blue Note, whether you're going to spend big money in originals, whether you're going to spend more modest money on some of the newer or analog reissues, or if you're going to try and scrape up whatever bargains you can find, your jazz collection will never be complete without a sizable sampling of Blue Note's sizable stable of classic recordings. So there you have it. I hope this was helpful. Please do put your comments below. Uh, be kind, uh, but also don't be shy about pointing out things that I have not had the time or space or the wit to comment on here, uh, because my hope is that this video is a resource for folks, as I said, who are really just starting to dip their toes into the wonderful world of Blue Note. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.